if you were haunted by a demon that made people die in horrifying accidents, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death curse in Smile. This woman is going to wish she never became a psychiatrist. Dr. Rose here is working at the hospital when her co-worker reveals a new patient has just been admitted. The police had dropped the girl off, but there's something deeply disturbing about her. Last week, she saw her professor die, and the girl was the only witness to his death. Concerned, the doctor walks into a room and finds the patient standing in the corner, terrified. Rose reassures the girl that she'll be safe here, and invites her to discuss what she's experiencing. But she'll regret asking this question. The patient joins her at the table, and the the girl explains she's been seeing an entity that takes on the form of different people throughout her day. Every time it appears, the creature will wear a terrifying smile and has told the girl that today she's going to die. Rose tries to explain these delusions are a traumatic response to stress, but the girl freaks out knowing that the doctor doesn't understand what's happening. Suddenly, the patient falls back in her chair and screams in terror, trying to run away from something in the room. Shocked, the doctor rushes over to the phone and immediately calls for help, but then it goes quiet. Looking around, she notices the patient's staring at her with a gigantic grin on her face. The woman doesn't know the girl has been possessed by a demon and can only watch as she collapses to the ground dead. Later that day, the doctor is questioned by the authorities who ask about the mental state of her patient, trying to understand what caused her death. Rose explains the girl was having delusions that an evil entity was haunting her and was smiling before she suddenly dropped dead for no apparent reason. It sounds insane, but soon this doctor will realize she's about to be haunted. Okay, this is really messed up. This girl was clearly in psychological distress and completely convinced that an evil presence was going to kill her. The doctor was trying to help, but didn't take the girl's fear seriously enough, and now she's dead with almost no explanation of why this has happened. What's even more suspicious is that the girl was a graduate student working on her PhD, and that means she would already be outside of the normal demographic to be experiencing this kind of mental breakdown. Studies all over the world have found that mental health issues are highest among people who have financial stress and unsustainable working conditions. The reason this is strange is because a student who's already working on her PhD would not only be competent enough to be accepted by the university, but it also means she's both financially and mentally stable enough to carry out the work. In fact, most PhD students are usually offered a basic stipend to cover living expenses during their studies because they don't have the time to keep a regular job. So identifying a clear cause for her behavior is very difficult to do. Now, the biggest mistake that Rose here made was to tell the girl that everything is okay, and immediately suggest that it's not as bad as she thinks. If someone believes they're being haunted by an evil presence, it could reveal a lot about how their mind works, and that's why if it were me, I would have asked as many questions as possible about what she's seeing, and when, to identify patterns that could explain the phenomenon. Now, if you look at this girl, we can clearly tell from the heavy bags under her eyes that she hasn't been sleeping, and based on her disheveled appearance, it's reasonable to assume she hasn't showered or changed clothes in days. These are classic signs of grief, and since we know she witnessed her professor die in front of her, there's a very good chance she might have had an intimate relationship with him without anyone knowing. A secret like this could plunge someone into a moral crisis, and if it's true, it wouldn't be surprising to discover she might even blame herself for his death. From this perspective, mentioning that you're being threatened by demons makes a lot of psychological sense to someone who's overwhelmed with guilt, and if the doctor had spent more time listening, she could have learned useful information because soon, Rose here is going to be plagued by the exact same curse. Having said that, everyone knows the best way to ward off an evil demon is by playing Raid Shadow Legends. Are you looking for a brand new turn-based MMORPG? Then Raid Shadow Legends is the perfect mobile game for you. Take part in epic raids, terrifying dungeon runs, campaign battles, and test your champions with PvP arena matches. As an avid player of the game myself, some of my favorite champions include a Sky Touch Shaman, who has excellent defense against debuffs and a unique passive healing ability. Not only that, the beastly Coronar is a force to be reckoned with, stripping down enemy attack and defense, allowing you to easily destroy your opponents. Raid Shadow Legends is constantly evolving, with a huge release this month in the form of a brand new faction called the Sylvan Watchers. This faction comes with a host of exciting new champions. Forest Elves, Aunts, Druids, Faze, they're all here, and I can't wait to summon them all to play with. The game constantly has a full lineup of events, along with a new season of Forge Pass, allowing you to collect some of the strongest gear this game has ever seen. Also, if you are an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. Now it's the time to hop in. New players can use my link or scan the QR code right here, getting a free starter pack worth almost 30 US dollars, including the free champion Burgians, and some neat in-game loot. You will find these rewards in your inbox for only 30 days, so make sure you get started ASAP. Find me in game under the name Chandler How to Beat to join my clan, and we can take on the Raid Shadow Legends world together.
Thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. That night, Rose heads home and tries to relax with a glass of wine. She can't get the dead girl out of her head, but that's when she notices someone is standing in the kitchen. Suddenly, a man calls out to her and the lights turn on. Her fiancé Trevor has arrived and he walks over, asking how her day went, but learns that she witnessed her patient die. It's hard for him to see his fiancé like this and he pulls her into a hug, but as Rose looks back towards the kitchen, she realizes there was nobody standing there. Later, the woman has dinner with her sister, Holly, but is lost in thought. She can't stop thinking about what happened in the hospital, and that's when her sister asks if she's coming to her nephew's birthday. The woman explains she'll be busy working, and the couple can't believe their ears. Frustrated, the aunt tells her she's working too hard and should be selling off their childhood home for profit, but the woman demands they change the subject. It's clear there's bad blood between these sisters, but it's only going to get worse. The next morning at work, Rose asks a colleague to find out more information about her dead patient's professor, and the woman promises to help, but that that's when the doctor is interrupted by one of the detectives from yesterday. It's her ex-boyfriend, Joel, and he explains he's here to check up on her, but Rose insists she's fine, walking away to her office. Inside, she reads through a witness statement from her dead patient and finds out her professor was smiling right before he died. It's eerily similar to what happened to the girl yesterday, but the woman is interrupted by a call from her sister. Answering the phone, Rose gets an apology for their argument last night as she walks over to the window, but then she sees something strange. There's a shadowy figure watching her in the distance, and it's making the doctor nervous. Walking down the hallway, the woman notices that a patient is staring straight ahead with a creepy smile on his face. It's weird, and Rose steps inside asking how the man is doing, but gets no response. He's still sitting there grinning like a creep, and she tries to snap him out of it, but that's when everything goes wrong. Suddenly, the man turns to her, repeatedly saying she's going to die, and the doctor backs out of the room, calling out for help. The nurses rush in to restrain the man, but Rose is shocked to realize that the patient was sleeping in bed this entire time. It doesn't make any sense, and these hallucinations are going to escalate into the scariest things she can imagine. Okay, this is only going to get worse. Rose here has just witnessed two different patients exhibiting the exact same symptoms, but what's even more horrifying is that this is also what the girl saw her professor doing right before he died. It's way too specific to shrug off as a coincidence, and it means we have to consider there might actually be something a lot more sinister going on beneath the surface. If we're seeing the same thing that these other victims have been seeing, then we either need to evaluate our own mental condition or decide to believe there's actually a demon that's haunting us and figure out how to defeat it. Now, Rose here seems like she's mentally stable, but if you're paying attention, there might be signs that she's actually suffering from repressed trauma. First of all, we can see that she has a tattoo on her back of a tree with its branches bending in the wind. Not only is it the only tattoo she has, but it probably symbolizes a reminder to be grounded in herself, even when there are strong forces trying to move you. This might indicate an underlying instability she's tried hard to protect herself from, and a strong chance it stems from a childhood trauma. Secondly, we've also seen three separate occasions where she's starting to see things that aren't actually happening. First, she thought there was something in the shadows of her house, then a mysterious figure through the window, and lastly, the patient screaming that she was going to die when he was actually laying in bed. These hallucinations are escalating to extreme psychosis, and if reality is beginning to slip away from us, then we can't trust anything that we see unless it's being confirmed by another witness. Before she died, the patient told us that she was seeing someone pretending to be other people, but it would smile as it told her she was going to die. It's been less than 24 hours hours, and now the exact same thing has just happened to Rose here. With this in mind, we have no choice but to accept the possibility that a demon is haunting us, and that's why if it were me, I would make sure I was always in the company of at least two other people I trust. It might be challenging to keep ourselves in large groups throughout the day, but if we see something that looks suspicious, we can confirm our reality with several others, helping us get a better sense of what is happening. We also need more than just one person, because if our only witness is acting strangely, we would have no other way to confirm that it wasn't a hallucination, so the more people we have around, the more likely we are to be grounded in reality. If this was an evil being, then it's fair to assume that the only reason it would be showing itself is because it wants to drive our paranoia and anxiety into extremes, so that it can manipulate us into making horrible decisions. That's why the most effective tactic right now is to distrust our own mental state until we find out more, and refusing to give this demon our attention might force him to finding a different strategy to get what it wants. 
later, the woman has a meeting with her boss and insists that the patient needed to be restrained, but the man disagrees. He thinks she's been affected by her former patient's death and demands she take a week off to recover. The woman knows what she saw, but there's nothing she can do to convince him and accepts his offer. Leaving the hospital, Rose visits a shop to pick up a toy train for her nephew, hoping that things will get better, with no idea this gift is going to backfire. That night, she returns home to relax and pours herself a drink when the thief alarm goes off, making the woman drop her glass. Terrified, Rose quickly picks up a knife, thinking that somebody has broken it, but when she walks over to the entrance, there's nobody there. The doctor checks the security system and shuts off the alarm, but as she's heading back into the living room, she notices that the back door is wide open. Suddenly, the phone starts ringing and Rose quickly picks it up, finding out that the security system company has been alerted of a break-in. The woman explains that the back door has been left open, but then the person on the hotline taunts Rose, insisting someone else is in the house. That's when the phone rings again, and the woman turns to see the devices back on the table like she never picked it up. Freaking out, the doctor answers the phone, and this time it's the real security company, but she's too confused to respond. The police are called to the house, and the cops walk out, insisting they found no signs of a break-in. The woman asks about the back door, but the men suggest it must have been left open, and that's when her fiancé arrives at the scene. Heading back into the house, he questions why she set the thief alarm, and Rose tells him she doesn't remember turning it on. That makes the man concerned, and she insists there's nothing to worry about, but Trevor isn't sure he believes her. She's been acting more erratically, and soon he'll discover the woman he loves is going insane. Later that night, Rose listens to an audio recording of her former patient's last words before dying, and that's when she hears something strange. Playing back a section of audio, the doctor notices a ghostly breathing and tries to listen closer when suddenly the dead girl appears in the room. She backs away in terror before standing up and quickly takes out a knife to defend herself just as her fiancé comes running out of the bedroom. He doesn't understand what's going on, and there's nothing he can do to help. Okay, this is getting out of control. Not only is she starting to get haunted more often, but now we know this creature can make her think the phone was in her hand. This means we can't trust what we hear or what we see, and it makes the situation scary as hell. Every single person we meet could be this evil entity hiding in plain sight, so we need to come up with a strategy to figure out exactly when we're being haunted before it's too late. Now, as terrifying as this seems, there might actually be a way we can take advantage of the situation. Based on what we know, this evil being is manipulating our perception of reality but can only seem to do this externally. In other words, we haven't been possessed yet, and even though the demon has a lot of information about us, it doesn't know everything. One of the most important things to realize about demons is that they can't read your thoughts. Even though they're supernatural, they still rely on making observations about your behavior and what you say, and try to use it against you. We should expect that they also know our entire history, because a supernatural entity would live outside of time, and it means they would have access to a record of your entire life, like it was an encyclopedia. With all of this in mind, we have to assume we are being watched 24-7 and be extremely careful not to say anything that can be used against us. But the more information we can hide from the creature, the easier it will be to stop this thing from tricking us. That's why if it were me, I would look for something I can use as a totem so that only I know the exact texture and weight of the object. This way, if we think there's a chance the demon has warped our reality somehow, then we can feel the totem, and if there are any differences, it will let us know that what's happening isn't real. This has to be done with a lot of secrecy, because if we are spending time selecting and studying special objects, it's going to figure out what we're doing. That's why the smartest way to handle this is to grab something small, put it in your pocket, and study its texture out of the demon's view. This one simple tactic could make a big difference, because keeping crucial information private will limit the demon and how much it can manipulate us. If we're aware that the evil entity is starting to play tricks, then we'll have more time to do something about the situation such as defend ourselves or run away before it's too late. The next morning, the doctor visits her therapist and tells the woman about her dead patient. She suggests her obsession with the girl might be related to her mother's death, but Rose changes the subject, revealing she's been hallucinating ever since the patient died. The delusions have been terrorizing her, and the therapist proposes she avoid anything that could remind her of the girl's traumatic death. With the session over, the woman heads to her sister's house so she can attend her nephew's birthday party. She's trying to enjoy herself and forget what's happened, but when the kid begins unwrapping his presents, everything goes wrong. He opens his aunt's present and is shocked to see what's inside. Confused, the boy pulls out a dead cat, and the doctor recognizes it's hers. Rose doesn't remember killing her own pet, and tells the party goers she would never do something so horrible horrible, but they all think she's crazy. That's when the woman notices one of the guests smiling at her as she realizes the entity has returned and is haunting her in broad daylight. Overwhelmed, the doctor 
Sister starts screaming, but suddenly the smiley woman appears in front of her and Rose trips, falling straight into a table. With no idea what's going on, she's brought to the hospital for treatment, where her boss makes sure she's okay, but the woman notices her fiancé getting into an argument with her sister. That night, Rose goes back to her fiancé's place, but before they head inside, she explains she's been haunted by the evil spirit that killed her patient. The man doesn't believe her, concerned that the woman is going crazy, and gets out of the car. Following him, the doctor argues she's not insane, and that's when the fiancé remembers that Rose might have inherited her mental illness from her mom. It's the only explanation that makes sense to him, and he tries to walk inside, but the doctor stops him. The woman insists she would never do anything to hurt him, but he suspects Rose killed their cat, making it clear he's afraid of what she'll do next. Desperate to get answers, the woman searches up her dead patient's professor and quickly makes a plan to find out more about the curse before it's too late. Okay, this is terrifying. Now the demon is haunting us during broad daylight in the middle of a kid's birthday party and killing our pets just to watch us freak out. It's actually a genius strategy because by doing this, the demon has turned everyone against us, convincing them we're mentally unstable and can't be trusted. At this point, we have to expect that anytime we ask someone for help, our friends and family are going to be much more likely to put us in heavy medication instead of believing our story. Keeping ourselves in a public environment isn't enough to stop the creature from manipulating us, and it means we need to go a lot further and taking matters into our own hands. It's reasonable to assume that if we know it's using our environment and perception against us, then by taking its tools away, it will have a lot less influence. That's why it might be a good decision to keep ourselves blindfolded throughout the day, making it much harder to be manipulated. Up to this point, sight has been the only sensory perception it has tried to target, and if we don't see what it's doing, then we can't react to it. I would then try to communicate with the creature and ask what it wants. It's important to point out that as powerful as they seem, supernatural beings are bound by a lot of rules with what they're allowed to do, and it usually comes down to a set of preconditions that gives them the authority to attack someone. This becomes even more apparent in exorcisms because the language that's always used in casting out demons has to do with their authority and the legal grounds they have to be in there in the first place. Now, we can't expect to argue a legal case with a demon that's a lot more knowledgeable about the subject than we are, but that doesn't mean we can't negotiate with it to help it get what it wants. If we're powerless to stop it, then the smartest thing we can do is help it, but insist that we will cooperate if it agrees to haunt someone else instead. From what we know, the monster seems to thrive off of psychological trauma because every victim so far has been a witness to someone's death. Rose here witnessed her patient die, and the patient witnessed her professor die, but this is such a rare and unlikely occurrence that it can't be a coincidence. With this in mind, I would return to work at the mental health clinic and offer the demon its selection of patients to terrorize as long as it leaves us alone. The best candidate might be an old war veteran because they would be the only other people in the clinic who might have witnessed someone dying. And if the demon is willing to switch targets, we'll be free from its manipulation tactics as long as it gets what it wants. It sounds horrible, but it's a trade-off that's worth taking. If we can contain the demon into haunting people who are already under the institution's control, then we can also exert a small degree of control onto the demon by extension, and it puts us in a better position to figure out how to destroy it. At the very least, this keeps the demon's bad behavior away from the general public, and if no more cats are showing up dead at children's birthday parties, then it's still a worthwhile strategy to take. The next morning, she visits the professor's widow, learning that the man had been behaving strangely and suffering from hallucinations before he died. The woman shows her his bedroom, which is covered in drawings of smiling creatures, and she explains this all started after the professor had watched someone die. It's just like what happened to her, and Rose realizes that this evil entity gets transferred whenever someone witnesses its victim's death. Desperate, she asks the widow if her husband ever found an explanation for what happened, but the woman has had enough. She refuses to answer any more questions and kicks Rose out of the house, leaving her more terrified than ever. With no one else to turn to, she visits her ex-boyfriend Joel and walks into his apartment. The woman begs him to look for any other police reports about the professor, and he reluctantly agrees. Searching him up, the detective discovers that the dead man had given a witness statement after seeing someone die a week earlier, and there are even photos from the crime scene. Rose takes his computer, examining the horrifying pictures, and notices the victim is smiling. It's just like what happened with her dead patient, and the doctor asks him to check if there's a police report. He looks into it, discovering the victim had witnessed a stranger die in front of her eyes, and there's even a recording of the incident. They watch it together, and the doctor notices that before the victim died, he was smiling. That makes the cop realize there's a pattern, and he asks her what's going on, but Rose refuses to answer. Later that day, she heads to her sister's house to talk, and the husband insists she leave, but his wife reluctantly agrees to 
hear the woman out. The doctor explains that she's been cursed, showing proof that other people have suffered the same fate, but Holly thinks she's having a mental breakdown just like their mom. That makes Rose furious, insisting the woman doesn't know what she's talking about, and the sister makes it clear she's no longer welcome here. Frustrated, the doctor heads back to her car, but as she's considering her next move, Holly walks up to the window and stretches her neck to look inside. The entity won't stop making the woman hallucinate, and there's nothing she can do to stop it. Okay, we finally confirmed that there's a clear pattern here. As I mentioned before, most supernatural beings are bound by a strict set of rules that allow them to operate in the physical realm, and identifying this is the most important step we can take towards figuring out how to stop it. From what we've learned, there's a long history of this thing making people die with the witness present, and will then haunt the witness until it's ready to kill them too. As terrifying as this sounds, it's actually revealing a fantastic strategy we can use against it, because we don't just know what it wants, but also what it needs. With all this research, not one one of these victims died without a witness present, and it likely means that as long as we isolate and avoid contact with anyone, the demon won't kill us. That's why if it were me, I would strongly consider booking an Airbnb somewhere in the mountains, making sure it's as far from civilization as possible. As long as there isn't anyone around for the evil entity to use as a witness to our death, then it's the best way to stop the demon from getting what it wants. It's not a long-term strategy, but we can use the time to investigate as much as we can find, and if we aren't constantly worried about getting murdered, it will be a lot easier to to focus on finding clues that can destroy this demon or drive it out of our lives for good. Now with that said, there might actually be a loophole here that we could take advantage of. According to their research, the demon would get transferred to the witness when the victim dies. But based on these past cases, the cause of death is always from a different method. If we had the time we needed to plan out a strategy, then I'd make sure I had as much control over this outcome as possible. That's why if it were me, I would cheat the demon by asking professional doctors to stop my heart and then bring me back like the Flatliners did. This way, we would be giving the demon exactly what it needs to get transferred to someone else, but without me having to die permanently in order to achieve it. It's obviously a risky strategy to take, but it's very possible that taking charge and exerting as much control over the situation as we can will effectively remove the demon's only weapon it has against us. Staging our deaths might even force the demon onto someone else that witnessed our heart stopping, and if it doesn't have any legal ground to haunt us anymore, then the demon would have no choice but to move on. That night, the doctor is eating in her car when Joel calls, revealing he's made a discovery. There were over 20 cases of someone witnessing a death before dying themselves in front of another witness, but only one of the cases has a survivor. According to the records, an accountant watched someone die, but instead of repeating the pattern, he killed a stranger to break the curse. The man has been in prison ever since, but what's strange is that the only witness to the murder died a week later in front of somebody else. This guy might have the answers they're looking for, and with only days left before she dies, the doctor asks her boyfriend to take her to the accountant. Driving away, the woman asks him how long it took before the next victims died, and he reveals that at most, they never survived more than four days. The doctor realizes tomorrow will be her fifth day, and the detective insists nothing will happen, but soon he'll be proven wrong. The next morning, they head to the prison where the accountant is being held, visiting the man to get some answers, and Rose asks him how he managed to survive the entity. He refuses to say anything unless the detective steps outside, and with no better options, the doctor insists she talk to him alone. The man leaves the room, and the accountant finally reveals he managed to pass on the curse by killing someone else in front of a witness. He explains that the entity spreads through trauma, but the doctor freaks out, insisting that she can't kill somebody. Suddenly, the accountant realizes that the woman is cursed and panics, screaming at her to get out. He's terrified she'll pass the curse back to him, and the woman leaves, horrified at what she's just learned. Rose goes back to her fiancé's place, knowing that she doesn't want to die like the other victims, but can't bring herself to murder someone. The woman has no idea what to do, but that's when she receives a text message from her therapist asking if they can meet. Rose refuses to respond and goes to the kitchen to grab a knife, but before the doctor can do anything, the doorbell rings. She answers the door to find her therapist outside, and the woman insists they talk about Rose's issues to make sure she's not a danger to anybody. If not, then the authorities will be called to deal with her, and the doctor has no choice except to let the woman inside. Sitting down on the couch, the therapist asks if she's still hallucinating, and Rose insists she's better now. Suddenly, the phone begins to ring, and the woman goes to answer the call, but then she hears her therapist on the other end. The doctor realizes the person sitting on the couch is the entity, and it starts smiling, warning the woman it's almost time for her to die. Terrified, Rose backs away from the creature as it walks forward, but the entity won't kill her until it's got the perfect opportunity to pass on the curse. 
Okay, this is absolute nightmare fuel. When your own therapist wants to kill you, it's a good indication that you aren't living life the right way. But at this point, Rose here should have known better than to put herself in this position. She's already seen firsthand how the smiling demon can appear as anyone, and that it's going to be looking for the woman to exhibit signs of emotional distress to make an appearance. If we're paying attention to the patterns, the woman should have realized that this is exactly what was happening when her therapist showed up. Instead of obsessing over the records, the woman should have been meditating to protect herself from becoming emotionally vulnerable for the demon to haunt her. The second mistake she made was letting the woman in the door. She's already been dodging her calls, and if we're already aware that the demon could become anybody, then this was clearly the dumbest thing she could do. If it were me, I would have stayed inside and ignored the therapist, because if the woman suddenly started trying to force her way inside, it would prove to us immediately that this was the demon. From there, we could rush into the kitchen, grabbing a knife to defend ourselves from the monster, but only after we left the no choice but to reveal itself. Now the truth is, it didn't even have to go this far. Earlier at the prison, we found out from this convict that he was the only person to have escaped the smiling curse, and the reason was because he murdered someone before it could kill him. As daunting as that sounds, the man is living proof that his method had worked, or else he would already be dead. This woman should be taking this news like it's a gift from God, because up until now, there has been no clear way to stop the creature from haunting her. If it were me, the first thing I would have done is start experimenting with this information, and starting with smaller insignificant life forms like bugs or mice to see if their sacrifices would be enough to end the curse on a technicality. If it doesn't work, then we would clearly need to kill a human, and even for survival, that's a lot more difficult than it sounds. We don't want to escape the curse only to wind up in prison like this guy, and that's why the smartest approach here would be to make a poison. It just so happens that one of the easiest and most accessible poisons to create is ricin, because the toxins come naturally from castor oil seeds, and you don't need anything more than everyday kitchen equipment to extract enough poison to kill someone. From that point, all we need to do is select a target and a delivery method. We want to make sure there are no traces of our involvement, so it should be given to someone random that we don't know and in an area that has no other witnesses. If we take a page out of Breaking Bad, the best approach might be to put it inside a cigarette and go to a bar, offering a half-empty pack to another smoker, explaining that we've just decided to quit. It's more than likely they will accept the gift, and over the course of a day or two, that rice and lace cigarette will end up getting smoked far away from us, making sure the demon has all the conditions it needs to officially leave us alone. Coming up with a plan, the doctor heads into the hospital and finds one of her patients inside his room. Turning around, he realizes who she is and backs away in terror as the woman tries to reassure him he's completely safe. Suddenly, her boss walks in and demands to know what's going on, but that's when Rose pulls a knife from out of her sleeve. Acting quickly, she attacks the patient, trying to pass on the curse, but he doesn't die no matter how many times she stabs him. Looking back at her boss, the doctor sees the man peel his face off, and she suddenly wakes up back in her car. The entity is tormenting her even in her dreams, and there's nowhere safe from its influence. Rose is startled by her boss knocking on the car window, and he asks what she's doing here, but the woman lies, insisting she doesn't remember. Noticing the knife, he begs her to come inside and talk, but she freaks out and drives away as fast as possible. On the road, her ex-boyfriend calls, demanding to know what is going on, and the woman explains her new plan. The entity must have witnesses nearby to keep passing the curse to new victims, but if she stays alone, then there's no way anyone else will die. It's a smart strategy, but Joel and Sissy come to help, not realizing this will be his biggest mistake. Parking the car, Rose arrives at her old childhood home and heads inside the abandoned building. With nobody else living in the area, the doctor is certain the curse won't be able to spread, and she walks into a bedroom, remembering how her mother died in bed. Rose could have called for help, but she ran away, leaving her mom to die alone. It's a traumatizing memory, and the doctor begins preparing the house to face off against the entity, making sure no one will know where she is. That night, Rose hears a strange noise in the building and tries it down to her mother's old room. Taking a look inside, she sees the entity sitting on the bed and realizes it's taken the form of her dead mom. The creature apologizes for being a bad mother and accuses the doctor of killing her, but she tells it to shut up. Rose refuses to feel guilty anymore, arguing she won't let her trauma destroy her, declaring to herself that none of this is real, but things are moments away from spiraling out of control. Okay, at this point, this demon is starting to get a little too transparent. Appearing as someone's mother who has already passed away is a clear sign that it's trying everything it can to get under her skin. The reason this is interesting is because if the creature is already inside the house and choosing to confront the woman, it would seem like there's no reason why it doesn't just kill her. Pretending to be someone's dead mother is very different from pretending to be another living human because it's an immediate giveaway that you're talking to a supernatural being. With that in mind, this actually might reveal something really important about this evil monster. 
monster because the only reason it would take this approach is to drive up her trauma as much as it can. It can't be a coincidence that Rose has recently admitted to feeling traumatized by her mother's death, and now she's being forced to confront one of her oldest emotional wounds. The demon is clearly using this against her, but it also suggests that causing traumatic stress or anxiety must be a precondition for it to be able to actually haunt or kill you. Now the truth is, Rose should have already been able to see through all of this evil entity's tactics, and if she had considered this revelation, she would have realized that the smartest thing she could do is close her eyes, laugh at the creature, and smile back. If we know it needs our trauma to take advantage of us, then this should be our first line of defense to make sure we aren't letting it affect us emotionally. Even meditating could be a useful tactic to fend off the demon, because it would help us block out external and internal emotional stimuli that could trigger our trauma. As silly as it sounds, it might be a lot more effective than trying to kill someone or attacking the demon, because a violent assault even in self-defense would only increase the trauma that you're putting yourself through. Soldiers have to go through unbelievably intense training just so that they're mentally prepared for the psychological horrors of killing someone. So it's reasonable to assume a doctor who spent her entire career trying to help others would have a very hard time doing something like that. If Rose had taken more time to think things through and analyze the evil entity's patterns of behavior, she could have reached the same conclusion and wouldn't be as vulnerable to the creature's tactics. The entity starts smiling at the woman and Rose backs away trying to escape, but the creature follows after her. It steps into the hallway and she runs off into the living room, but as she checks to see if the creature is close by, it suddenly appears behind her. The entity throws the doctor to the ground and starts strangling her, but then Rose spots the burning lamp on the ground. Coming up with a plan, she rips the creature's hand off of her neck and slams the lantern into its face. The entity lets go of her and the doctor quickly backs away, leaving the building as fast as she can. With the monster dead, Rose heads all the way to her ex-boyfriend's place and he welcomes her in, asking what happened. Relieved, she apologizes for all the trouble she's caused him and begs him to keep her company tonight. The man forgives her, promising to stay with the woman forever, and that's when she realizes this isn't her ex-boyfriend. He starts smiling as Rose figures out she's still hallucinating, and the woman tries to run out of the apartment but finds herself outside of the old house. She never escaped, and to make matters worse, the real Joel has just found her. The woman heads back inside the building, terrified that she'll get him killed, and locks the door. It's the only way to keep him safe, but as Rose is hiding, the entity approaches her. There's nothing she can do to escape her fate, as the creature begins to climb down her throat. That's when Joel manages to break the door open and enters the house, finding Rose standing in the middle of a room. Terrified, he calls out her name, and she turns around, revealing a huge grin on her face, and Joel realizes getting back with your ex is never a good idea. But what do you think? How would you be smiling? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.